Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dan Manuel, along with other panelists here today who are going to be discussing a, a tremendous biblical topic today right here on Give Me the Bible, and we hope you'll stay with us. You know, there are a lot of things in life that often get our attention, and uh, you know, when the masses would come to hear Jesus speak, he would challenge them with words like this, take heed that you hear, but he also said, take heed how you hear. You know, sometimes we don't really lend our ears to the Word of God as we read it. Uh, sometimes we haphazardly read the Bible uh, or maybe even listen to a gospel sermon. I hope this morning that you're eager and that you're ready to learn what God has to say about hearing His law. You know, James said many years ago that uh, we ought to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. The book of Hebrews is a great book and especially in the second chapter, the Bible tells us that God got their attention with miracles and wonders and signs. Now, we know today that there are ways that God might get our attention. Uh, sometimes he gets it in strange ways. Uh, have you ever had someone get your attention, maybe just, uh, uh, just out there, out of the clear blue? I've had it happen many times. It may be a police car that pulls up behind you and flashes his lights, or it could be a tornado or bad winds or a storm. Well, let's talk today about what the Bible teaches about those things and uh, why God gets our attention. He wants us to learn and to better equip ourselves to become better servants of Almighty God. I'm going to go to Randy Foreman right now, and I want to ask Randy the question. You know, Randy, uh, Paul writes in the book of Hebrews that we should never let those things slip from our mind. But how do we hold on to those ways that God really gets our attention, and how do we keep them from slipping away from our mind? Thank you, Dan, and that's exactly the questions I want to answer uh, this morning. We certainly do need to listen to God, and especially we need to listen up to God. This is important because life demands that we be very, very careful, especially spiritually. In Hebrews 2, 1 through 3, the scripture records, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The writer in this passage is not directing this to those who have heard the message and not accepted it, but to those who have accepted it. You see, the burden, friends, is on us. The gospel message is not a message that we can ignore simply because we have accepted and obeyed it. Our life in Christ still deserves our immediate attention. Otherwise, it might just be less important in our hearts and in our minds. Peter's point in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 10 is following. To make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, then with knowledge and self-control, and then with steadfastness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and finally love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Savior Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Here Peter also tells the church to pay more careful attention so that we don't drift away. He is clearly implying that you don't just add these virtues or else you could drift away. But if you have these virtues, you cannot fall. It is important that we understand that the gospel is a life or death message. It's an eternal message 
message. That means that you and I cannot afford to either drift away or become numb to its saving message or take for granted our life in Christ. Think about this. If you drift away, you die. If you become numb, you may be already dead. The only way to not drift away is to be anchored in Jesus. So listen up, my friends. Remember, safe in the arms of Jesus, safe on His gentle breast. There or shaded by His love, sweetly our soul shall rest. Dan? Thank you, Randy. And isn't that true? Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that God really warns us and actually tells us about things that are to come and how these things can affect the lives of all of us? Well, we're so thankful this morning that you have joined us for our telecast, and we hope that we'll be able to share with you something this morning that can really be beneficial to you and uh, something that will remind you every day of how God got your attention. Now, we want to go to uh, Joe Hancock at this time. And uh, Joe, I know that there are many other stern warnings there in that second chapter of the book of Hebrews, and I'm going to ask you, if you would, to expound on a few of those at this time. Thanks, Dan. I'd be glad to. You know, the Hebrew writer gives us uh, a lot of warning, a lot of uh, concern about uh, falling away about uh, the deceitfulness of sin, about uh, not learning and growing in Christ as we should. Let's take a look at a couple of just different passages in uh, chapter 3 at verse 12 down through 19. In verse 12 he writes, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And he gives the correction for that. He says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of of sin. And he goes on in the remainder of that passage down at verse 19. He speaks about those who fell in the wilderness, those who died in the wilderness because of unbelief. In verse 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. You know, we must choose to believe and to continue to believe in God's Word as long as we're growing in Christ. In chapter 5, the Hebrew writer said this down at verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. You know, a lot of Christians don't grow as they should. Uh, when we become a Christian, whenever that was in your life, however many years you've been a Christian, uh, it is possible that by now you ought to be teachers. But a lot of folks, unfortunately, don't grow and prosper in their knowledge enough of God's Word and how to deal with and teach God's Word that they can be teachers. And so the Hebrew writer warns against that in chapter 6, uh, verses 4 through 6. Uh, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, it is, he says in verse 4, it's impossible. He finally gets down to that point, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. You know, when we fall away, uh, it is, it's like crucifying Jesus all over again. He was crucified for our sins. We accepted that gift of, of salvation through his death and resurrection. And once we put him on through baptism, and to fall away is like saying, I've changed my mind, I don't need you anymore. And that is totally not the truth. We need Jesus until the day we pass from this life. You know, Dan, there's a lot of reasons people would fall away, and the Hebrew letter is just loaded with warnings and concern about that very thing, not growing enough, not being able to teach when we should, uh, falling away through the deceitfulness of sin, or just changing our mind to go back into the world, as Demas did, and, and live on our own without Jesus. And however we fall away, however we're not growing, we need to change that to be found pleasing to God and to bring the gospel to other souls. Well, uh, Joe, you're exactly right. We have to be on guard all the time. When you really stop and think about it, we in the Bible, even in the New Testament, four of those books are the biographical sketches of the life of our Lord. And then in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, but beyond that, in the book of Romans through Revelation, these are letters challenging us not to let these things slip, but to hold on to them. Uh, make it all the way to the end with your torch still burning. 
Now, we're going to call on John Hafner right now. And, John, I know that there are consequences. A lot of people fail to realize it. But there are consequences to letting these things slip. Isn't that true? That's right, Dan. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. You know, as we continue through here in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, look at what's said in verse 2. Uh, for if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, and on into verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Uh, I want you to think about the consistency of God here. Far too many people today talk about the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament as if they're different. No, we have great consistency from our Maker. And in every age and in every law under every dispensation, the idea of trust and obey is seen. And that's what's being described here in Hebrews 2.2. Uh, this word that was spoken through messengers, both heavenly messengers and messengers, prophets, humans who are sent by God to carry, it proved steadfast. Why? Because every transgression or disobedience to the law received punishment. And by that same token, every act of obedience, every uh, righteous and faithful walk received reward. Think about Abraham, a man who was justified by his faith. He was counted as righteous. Why? Because he obeyed. And then we see countless examples of those who disobeyed and there was punishment because of it. But the word spoken proves God's trustworthy character. And we see that there is a very real, very definite consequence to drifting away from God. It's that punishment to say you have rejected the teaching of grace. Uh, now, that's something that's not too popular today because people have a misunderstanding of grace. They say, well, grace is just that gift that's being forced upon you. It's irresistible grace, and there's nothing you can do about it. But that's not what the Bible says. Grace has a message to it. Grace can either be accepted or rejected based on whether or not you obey that teaching. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. But as you come into verse 12, Titus 2.12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Well, not everyone's living soberly, righteously, and godly. Does that mean the grace of God hasn't appeared to all men? No, it means some men are rejecting the grace of God. They're not willing to obey that teaching, the message that's provided there. And so, yes, there's a very real consequence to drifting away from God. Every act of disobedience, every transgression, as our text in Hebrews 2 says, it received a just reward. And that's something to address as well. When we talk about sin being punished, how does the Bible describe it? A just action. Because our God is just, He will not allow sin into His presence. Because our God is just, He will not allow wrongdoing to go unpunished. This has very real obligation for you and me today, that we would be faithful so that we can avoid that punishment and be right with God. Dan? Thank you, John. Well, when we move along in that chapter, we, we also recognize that one of the questions that he mentions there is somewhat of a rhetorical question in reality. And he says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Well, I'm going to toss that question this morning over to Dennis Morris from over in Jefferson, Texas. And Dennis, how shall we escape? Brother Dan, you know, we will not escape. I think a lot of times people focus on the reward and they really don't think about the concept or the idea of punishment. And yet the Bible teaches both. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. Uh, we notice, for example, that it says this <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 10. He says, For must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. And of course, he also bears the same thing out over in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 14 and verse 12. It says, So we all must appear before the judgment seat of God, and we shall give an account for ourselves before God. And so let's make sure that we do not allow the Word of God to lose its significance in our lives. Let's make sure that we understand that there is a reward that is promised to those who come to God, who live a faithful life for God, but then if we choose not to come to God or even to turn away from God, that there is a punishment that has been promised as well. It is a warning to us to make us want to turn to God and to do what God would have us to do.
Even the Hebrew writer talked about this there in chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. He says, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have, want, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. The point being is, here are these individuals who had learned, and yet they had allowed those things that they had learned to slip from them because they were dull of hearing. They needed someone to come back and to teach them again. Let's make sure that we hold on to the Word of God, make sure that the Word of God is significant in our lives so that when it tells us something, we're willing to do what God says because otherwise we will stand condemned. You know, as far as God's people are concerned, if we turn away from God, if we neglect that salvation that we're talking about, that we are going to lose that hope that we have, and that hope is the hope of eternal life. You'll find that in connection with the statement, it's talking about neglect here, not the concept of rejection. We're talking about those who already knew, those who had already obeyed, and yet they had neglected that salvation that they had received as a result of coming to God through the gospel message. And so as Christians, we are not to allow our faith to become stagnant. We are not to allow our minds and our hearts to be drawn back to those things that we once did before we became Christians because that's what those to whom the Hebrew writer was writing, that's what they were doing. And so let's make sure that we understand that salvation is a way of life. Brother Dan. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you so much. And it is a way of life. You know, we're very fortunate to have some tremendously educated men on this program sharing with you the Word of God uh, every Lord's Day when we come into your home. And I hope you are listening this morning. I, I hope you are taking heed uh, to hear what is being said and, and how you're listening. I hope you're listening intently. We're going to go to Chris Vidakovich now from Kilgore. And uh, Chris, um, I know that all of us find it difficult sometimes to, to really listen and hear. But you know, the Bible says that our salvation is confirmed in Christ. What, what does he really mean by that? Well, Dan, there's so many things that we can think of when we think of that idea of being confirmed. And there's so much evidence that we can see in the scriptures, especially evidence that comes from Jesus himself, but also even historical evidence that proves that, that Jesus came to this earth, that he lived on this earth, that he died, and also that he was resurrected. And the things that we see in the scriptures, as well as the things that we see through history, give us that confirmation that we need. Uh, when we first talk about salvation in this passage in, in Hebrews chapter 2, it, it says starting in verse 3 that after salvation was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed by those who heard Him. God also testified with them by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. And, and so just, just thinking about the people who followed after Jesus, why would they live the way that they did and give up everything that they had in life if the salvation wasn't real, if the resurrection wasn't real. But even Jesus, at, at one point, Jesus had uh, every opportunity to be the most popular man in the world. Uh, he could have performed miracle after miracle after miracle, but there's a point in Mark chapter 1 when he's performing these miracles, and Peter comes up to him and he says, hey, this is really great. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Every, everybody is looking for you, and they're looking for him so that they can see him perform miracles or have them perform miracles for someone. And Jesus says to him in Mark chapter 1, verse 38, let's go somewhere else so that I can preach, for that is why I have come. And the miracles were there to confirm that he had the authority to preach. But even when he preached without the miracles and the signs and the wonders, the people listened to him because he was one who had authority, not like their teachers of the law. So the confirmation was there even just in his words. And, and that was essential for us as well to realize when we read the word of God, and especially when we read the words of Jesus, there's a confirmation there that we know that this is the truth, that we know that this is real. And we know such as in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, when Peter and John said, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. We know it's by the name of Jesus. And when we look at some of the other passages like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, 
And when we look at that, we know that Jesus came to this earth. We look at Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We know that His reason for coming was so that we could be saved, we could be rescued, forgiven of our sins, and we could have the hope of eternal life. And so when we put our confidence in that, there's nothing in this world that can harm us, that can take it out away from us. But, but Dan, we have to be confident in Jesus and always stay faithful to Him. Chris, thank you very much. And I think you really hit it there at the last, too. We have to be faithful to Him. Wasn't it Jesus who taught in the book of Revelation 2 and verse 10, to Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. It's not enough to begin, but we must end the way that God wants it to end. You see, Solomon said many years ago that better is the ending of a thing than the beginning thereof. Now, in our last segment here, we want to go to uh, Chris Grota from over at Mount Pleasant. And Chris, I know that it really wasn't the signs and the wonders and the miracles that, that were really so impressive. What really is impressive is the fact that Christ went to the cross, secured our salvation, asked us to live for Him, and that someday there's going to be a judgment that is based upon what we have done with our life with regard to the salvation that He offers unto us. Isn't that really what the Bible teaches? Yes, Dan, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm very glad that you're watching uh, this Bible program uh, this morning. Now, you know, it has been mentioned a moment ago, and I'm just going to give you some other verses to back up what has already been said, but uh, when we're talking about taking heed to what you hear and how you hear it, I believe it's very important that you take what you're hearing in religion and to filter it through God's Word. Now, Acts 17, verse 11 tells of the Jews that were more noble in Berea than those that were in Thessalonica. And when they heard the Word of God, when they heard the preaching, they would go back to the Bible, the Old Testament, and they would search out the Scriptures to see if what they were being told was true. Now, you take those Old Testament Scriptures that confirmed the Word, they could go back and check it out. They couple that with the miracles that were done, Peter affirmed in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 22, that God, uh, Jesus was attested by God with mighty works and wonders and signs which God did through Him in the midst of themselves as they also knew. And, and then when you think about this, what Paul said in Acts or in uh, Romans 1 verses 16 and 17, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation uh, to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that is the gospel, uh, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And so, again, another confirmation, another revelation. Um, the, the importance of all of this, you've got eyewitness testimony, you've got, uh, you've got their testimony recorded on uh, in documents for us. Uh, we're hinging our eternal salvation, our afterlife, on the, on the information in this book and their eyewitness testimony. When I think about the confirmed Word of God, the judgment is even more certain now, and we cannot neglect so great a salvation. I need to go and tell my friends what God has done in my life. It's not about the miracles and the very... The very uh, things that we think are so impressive. It's what God is doing in my life. And I think about the Gadarene demoniac in Mark chapter 5, verse 19, when he was cleansed of the devil. He wanted to hang out with Jesus. And Jesus says, no, you go to your friends and your family and you tell them what great things the Lord has done in your life. And so God is taking an interest in our life. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2, God says, I've listened to you and, and I have helped you today is the day of salvation. And so uh, how shall we escape then if we neglect so great a salvation, Hebrews 2 verse 3, by not telling people what God is in fact doing in our life? Back to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Chris. And you know what? Those of us that are children of God hang out with Christ on the Lord's day. Factually speaking, we are with Christ every day, but uniquely in that worship setting. When we come together to honor God and to praise Him as our Lord and as our Maker and the one who secured our salvation. But our role also is to tell you, as we're doing today, about the salvation that you can have in Christ our Lord.
I appreciate so much these panelists today sharing with us these timely truths about God. I hope that if you're not a Christian that we have somewhat whetted your appetite uh, to learn more about God. You know, someday we are going to face that judgment. And I hope that you're not neglecting the salvation that is in Christ this morning. I hope that if you're a Christian, that you'll be made stronger as a result of our time spent here today. And I hope that you'd want to go and be with Christ in the worship service like we are uh, in a few moments. You know, the Bible says that, that David said many years ago, I was glad when they said unto me, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. Someone invited him. And you know what? That's what we're doing for you today. We're inviting you to come and join us at the house of God as we worship our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. These timely truths that have been presented today are those things that will face us in judgment. If you're not a Christian, let me appeal to you to become one. Based upon your honest belief in Christ to be the Son of God and with a penitent heart, as Jesus taught in the book of Luke 13, 3 through 5, and with a desire to really confess Him as Lord and Savior and then to be immersed in water baptism, that that salvation may become real to you, and it can. It became real to me when I was 13 years of age. God didn't speak to me in a supernatural way, but I listened to His Word. Having listened to that Word, God got my attention. I walked down the invitation aisle and surrendered to Christ. I hope you're prepared to do that today. Join us next week for another presentation of Give Me the Bible. Sing to me, of heaven, sing that song of peace. From the toils that by me it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted down a pressing soul. Showers of great blessing on my heart will flow. Sing to me, to me of heaven, let me find me dream of its golden glory. The Give Me the Bible program is an in-depth look at the Holy Scriptures. We hope that you would join us this coming Sunday right here on this same station for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. I'm Dan Manuel inviting you again to join me along with other panelists as we reason together from the truths of God's eternal word right here on Give Me the Bible this coming Sunday. Jesus.